Amen. Before you're seated, turn and tell your neighbor good morning. Has everybody had a good time this morning? Yeah? That was great praise and worship. Um, if you're visiting with us, my name is Philip Brand. I'm the pastor here. If you're not visiting with us, I'm still Philip Brand. I'm the pastor here. Yeah, so, so glad you're with us. Um, summer is almost over. Yeah. Yeah. I know that some of you are going to get technical on me and say it's not over until the middle of September, but after Labor Day, you can't wear white, so it's over. Right? You just can't wear white, so it's over. Yeah, so next weekend, um, Labor Day weekend, we're actually starting a brand new series next week called Living Spaces, and so looking forward to that. And so this means that this is the last one in our beautiful series in Ecclesiastes. So um, there you go. I, uh, last two messages in this series, I've really looked forward to. So why don't you turn in your Bibles to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11. That's where we're at. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. <clears throat> While you're turning there, um, I did come across a church sign this week, and it said this, free trip to heaven, details inside. <laughs> Not really sure what they're, <laughs> what's going on in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it might be a dangerous place to go to church. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Yeah. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Um, this is, of course, written by the wisest man that's ever lived outside of Jesus, and he has some things to say in uh, verses 1 through 6, actually 7 and 6 is where we'll start. And this is what he says, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. All God's people said, hmm, hmm. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for all you know, for you know not what disaster may happen on the earth. Hmm. That's what all guys people. Hmm. That's what you're supposed to say. It's wise. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls in the south or to the north in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. All guys people went, hmm. It's deep. It's deep. Verse 4, he who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. And all God's people went, hmm. So I know after reading those four verses, life is clear to you right now. <laughs> it's totally clear to you. You absolutely know what's going on. You're like, wow, that really spoke to my heart today. Wow, hmm, it's good. Then we get to verse 5. It says, as you... Do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. So all of a sudden, verse 5, we start getting some commentary on what verses 1 through 4 might be talking about. And here, it's talking about the knowledge of God and what He does in the world. And if you were to take Ecclesiastes and take one thing out of it, theologically, Solomon would say, we never know what God is going to do here on earth. We never know. He's unpredictable. Absolutely unpredictable. Now, you and I are created in the image of God, right? You and I are. And you and I are married to the opposite, well, not everybody in the room. There's some of us in this room that is married to the opposite sex, right? Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure that that's what's going on. So, so I got married to Nicole and there's, she's made in the image of God. And there are some times that I have no idea what she is doing. <laughs> right guys? Absolutely. What in the world, what is she thinking? And on Nicole's side, she looks at me and I'm made in the image of God and she's going, Really? Really? What, what are you doing, right? 
And so made in the image of God, we already have this kind of concept that God is teaching us that we don't understand what was created in the image of God, much less we understand what God is doing in the world. There are just some times that we do not understand what God is doing. So verse 5 says, As you know the way the Spirit comes to the bones of a child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. Now he didn't say the bones of the child and creating the bones of the child in the womb by mistake. He didn't do that. First, I just have to say, life begins at conception. Absolutely. It's all the way through the Bible. All the way through the Bible. Second thing, when a baby is formed in the womb, you are looking forward to the expectation where you will be able to hold the baby. Right? There's a future sense in this. And so the picture here, the analogy here, is that whatever God is doing in the world that you don't understand, however he's interacting with you that you don't understand, he has a plan for your future in everything that he is doing. So whatever he's doing today, whatever he's creating for you, wherever it's going for you, there is a future for you. He's doing something today to create a future for you tomorrow, and we have no idea what he's trying to do. And in fact, sometimes we go through our lives and still try to figure out what he's done in our lives. But he is always doing something significant in your life. So you don't know, it says. And then you get to verse 6. In the morning sow your seed, and at evening without... Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Let me read that again. In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand. For you do not know which will prosper this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Now, planting is also a future thing, right? Right? You put seed in the ground, you're waiting for a future crop. I have tomato plants that, unfortunately, I um, planted expecting tomatoes in July. So I've gotten one tomato. And you know how this is going to work, right? Come September, it's just going to be a bunch of green tomatoes. They're not going to turn red. That's just how that's going to happen. That is my future. I planted late. The point here is that every time you plant, there's some type of future that you're creating. Either you're creating a green, um, useless tomato future, or you're planting a plant that you're going to actually get something you can use. Right? Either you're planting when you're supposed to plant it, or you're not planting where you're supposed to plant it. And whatever you plant, you're going to get in the future. You're going to get the results of that in the future. You and I are in the image of God, and we are created in such a way that we can create our own futures. We can create what happens in the future for us. Now, overall, God has a plan right? And we can't touch his plan, and we can't touch his future planning, but he has given us the responsibility to create a better future. So what you do today will have benefits for tomorrow. It's what you say, what you do, how you act, uh, who you invest in, all kinds of stuff. You can create a better future for you today by doing the right thing today that you will benefit from tomorrow. Now, animals do not do this. Your dog at home doesn't create a better future for himself. Actually, if reincarnation was real, I'd want to come back as a dog. I've seen them be, look, I see dogs walk, being walked in my neighborhood, and there's people that carry a bag with them. And when they do their little business on the ground, something is good. Really? That's like living like a king, right? (laughs) Right, God? Right? Right? It's like living like a king. Animals do not do anything to make their lives better. You cannot point to a place in history where an animal has created something better. You can't. Now, birds will build nests in your little houses, but they didn't create the houses. Animals don't do that. Why? Because animals are not in the image of God. And so they're not going to create a new future. It is unique to us. And so we've created a lot of things. 
Elon Musk is, is trying to get us to heaven. Well, sorry, to outer space, right? And he's created these, these ships to do so. He's constantly creating, tr- constantly trying to push the human race forward. And God has created us that way. We can create our own future. We can create a better day tomorrow. So verse 6 is about action in the moment. In the morning, sow your seed. And at evening, withhold not your hand. In other words, take action for your life and do something positive with it. Don't just sit on your hands at home. Don't just play video games. Don't just binge watch Netflix or whatever streaming service you might have. Don't do that. Get out and work. Do something. Be in action. Create a future. In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. You don't know what will prosper and what will not prosper. I think a lot of times people do not create a a new future, a new better day for tomorrow, or they don't work, or they they are um, stuck with inaction, if you will, because they're afraid that what they're about to do might fail. Right? So they're just afraid. So, yeah, I would really like to do that, but I'm not sure how it's going to turn out. And I really need to know how it's going to turn out before I start doing it. And the Bible teaches clearly, you don't need to know how it's going to turn out before you start doing it. Just start doing it. Start planting your seeds and do not withhold your hand in the evening. Keep working, keep working, keep doing the right thing. Don't wait for some type of certainty that you're going to get some type of return for the work that you're doing. Do it. But there's a lot of people that just want it to be safe. Like, I don't know. I don't know if I should help that person because I don't know how they're really going to respond to my help. I don't, I don't know if they will really take what I'm trying to help them with and actually benefit themselves for it. I'm not sure what's going to happen if I do this good deed. I'm just not sure about it all. And so maybe I'll just wait and see, and I'll just sit back and watch. And God is saying right here in the scripture, his people are never supposed to sit back and watch. We are always supposed to be at work doing good in the world because we do not know what will prosper and what will not prosper. There are some times that God doesn't allow something to prosper so something else will prosper. Okay? You're going down this road and it just doesn't work. Well, he did that so this over here will prosper. And sometimes what you do, God makes prosper and we're all joyous. But whichever one it is, we are still working the way God wants us to work, and we're still investing in the world. And that brings us to verse 1. And verse 1 says this, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Cast your bread upon the waters. This is a picture of action. You're casting bread onto water. How many of you have ever cast bread into water to feed fish? right? How many of you have just ever just threw bread into the water and there's no fish in the pond? A couple, okay, a couple people, yeah, okay, yep. Well, yesterday I decided to do a little experiment to see what would happen if I put bread in water, all right? And, then, and so I put a bowl of water and put bread in a water. So this is Nicole's lunch today, <laughs> okay? It's what she'll be eating, <clears throat> yep. Does that just look delicious? What happens when you put bread in water? It soaks up the water. What if here Solomon is talking about time? And what if bread is the good deeds that you do with your time that soaks up the time around you? Doesn't activity soak up your time? How many of you have ever noticed that when you have absolutely nothing to do, time seems to creep? But when you're in a project and you're doing something and you're working and you're working and you're working and you're working, it seems to go really quick, right? 
If you want time to slow down, just kind of take a breath but, and get bored. Right? Just get bored. But if you're doing something that goes quick, bread is a symbol of our activity, and we throw the bread into the water of time, and it soaks in, and it makes a difference. So he's saying, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. This is a command, first of all. And second of all, there's a promise at the end of it, isn't it? It says, you will find it after many days. How many times have you done something that you just felt like it was a waste of time? Have you ever done a good deed that you thought was a waste of time? Have you ever helped somebody out and you just thought it was a waste of time because it didn't help them out at all? Have you ever been at, at that point, it was just a stinking waste of time? Well, here in this passage of Scripture, God is saying, even when you think it is a waste of time, you will get a return for the good deed that you have done. It is not a waste of time to help people that squander it. It is not a waste of time to help people who will not squander it. You cast your bread upon the water. You do your, do, your good deeds for God. You work for him the best that you can. And you see what the return is because the return is coming back to you. It is not a waste of time. This is a promise, for you will find it after many days. Cast your bread, you will find it. It might got off. You might not even see it. You might not even know that it's coming back. But one day, it will come back to you. It will come back to you. And that leads us to verse 2. Give your portion to seven or even eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on the earth. That particular word, forgive, is this word in the Hebrew. This is Nathan. Nathan means to give. It means to give a blessing. It means to give help, is what Nathan means. And there are many people in the Bible and throughout time that have been called Nathan. It means to give. It's giving something. And here it says, give to seven or eight. Give to seven or eight. Do a good deed to more than just one person. Okay, so it's not just one family that we help. It's another family that we help. And we help, help these people. And we help over here. And we help over here. And we, we help over here. It's seven or eight. You just continually help people. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on the earth. Have y'all ever been helped by anybody? I have. That help created momentum for you, didn't it? Created momentum. Part of the momentum was you were kind of surprised that someone thought of you in your time of need, right? Right? And it created momentum because you thought, they thought of me. They really love me. They really helped me out in this moment. Another thing that created momentum for you is because you had a need and you didn't know how to get out of the mess that you were in. And they came in and did something and they just made your mess a little bit easier. And it gained momentum for you. You see, every time we cast our bread upon the water, every time we do good deeds for people, it creates momentum. But it also creates momentum for you personally. Have you ever done something good for somebody and then they really reacted in a very kind way and it just encouraged you? And then you were more open to help somebody else? Right? It's just like a warm feeling inside and, and it gains momentum for you. Have you ever helped somebody and you didn't know how it affected them until later? And like many years later, you found out because you did this good deed here, it came back to you, and they told you about it, and how that little deed changed their lives. And all of a sudden, you gain more momentum from what that good deed that you cast away over here, you found it came back to you later is what happened. Um, I used to pastor in Kentucky, and we had the Iwana program. And there was a, a, a kid in the water program, and every time he came in the door, he had a rough home, every time he came in the door, I would say hello to him. 
Give him a high five. That's all I did. I wasn't his Awana leader. Um, I did do a couple of council times, but really, it was just really a small piece of bread thrown in to the waters of time, just very small. A couple of years ago, he contacted me on Facebook, and he said, I wanted to contact you because you were always kind to me when I came to your church. You always gave me a high five. You always made me feel important. As a result of that, I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, and now I'm going to be a missionary on the foreign field. That's a pretty big return for just a high five. That's a pretty big return for just saying hello to somebody. That's a pretty big return. And the kingdom gained. Are you tracking? So you never know what the little good deed, the little word, the little thing that you're doing, how that is going to affect somebody and soak up the time and redeem the time for the glory of God. Yeah. So it says, give a portion to seven or to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on the earth. This particular verse doesn't tell us that there will never be a disaster. It says there will be disasters on the earth. Isn't that comforting? Yeah. It's good now, but disaster is coming, right? You're having a good day now, but disaster is just right over the horizon. You had a good day yesterday, but today's here, and disaster may be a part of today. The Bible is just very clear. It says disaster will happen, and it says do good deeds while you can because disaster is on the way. And when disaster happens, if you are a person that constantly do, does good deeds for people and helps people and helps people and helps people and helps people, when disaster does hit, you will be hope for those people that are experiencing the same disaster that you are experiencing. Did y'all get that? The momentum goes into when everybody's in a tough situation. In a situation where the world is falling apart because you have had the habit of doing good deeds, doing good deeds, doing good deeds, doing good deeds for the glory of the Lord. When disaster happens and you walk in the room, people will look to you as a person of hope. Don't you want to be people like that? When disaster happens and you walk into the room because of God and what he's done through you, you are a symbol of hope in a very dark time? We all have people like this, don't we? That show up from time to time when we're having a bad day. They seem to walk in the room and all of a sudden, oh man, I'm glad Matt's here. Can he just sing a little bit for us, please? Oh, come on. <laughs> right? Can he, can he just say, sing that song, there's nothing better than you, just one more time, right? And all that he gives in his music ministry here. I'm not saying anything about Katie, I'm not saying anything about Nicole. Y'all did an awesome job. I'm just giving an illustration so I don't want to be in trouble to, when I get home, and I don't want to be in trouble this week. It's the illustration, right? You walk into the room. These people are alike, and you're like, okay, everything's going to be okay. It's bad, but everything's going to be okay because Nicole is here. Everything is going to be okay because Bob is here. There's a sense of stability that comes in when people know that you've cared in the good times and that you're going to continue to care when disaster hits. We do good deeds, because we do not know what's going to happen in any given day. So then, you know, Solomon gets even more profound. He says, if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. <laughs> Thanks for that. We already knew that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Solomon. If the clouds are full of rain, 
They empty themselves on the earth. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Captain Obvious. <laughs> We're very familiar with nimbus clouds, right? Those are the clouds that rain. So what is he saying here? Hmm. Let's think about it. Did you know that not all clouds produce rain that hits the earth? There are some clouds that are just clouds. They never do anything for anybody. There are some clouds that are so thin you can barely see them in the sky. They're pretty, but you can barely see them in the sky. And then there's the puffy clouds, you know, up there. They're not going to produce rain. It's the thick, dark clouds that you know that rain is coming or something is coming, right? It's nimbus clouds. Now, there's several categories of nimbus up underneath here, but nimbus is the only one that produces partic participation, which is precipitation, participation, <laughs> precipitation on the earth, okay? And they produce rain on the earth. You know, this past July, what did we all want? Rain. What do we all want now? Sunshine. <laughs> right? We needed rain. And rain came because rain benefited the earth. It helped our grass. It helped our crops. It, it helped our trees. It helped our environment. It was just great to have rain. Rain was good. And so he says here, if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. They bless the earth with rain is what he's saying. So first, you can only bless other people if you're full of something. Good. You can only bless people with what you're full of. If you're full of kindness and joy and hope, you will bless the people around you. But if you are filled with bitterness, anger, and pain, you will be acid rain on people's parade. Come on, church. Whatever your cloud is full of is how you will impact this world. How are you impacting this world? What are you raining down on people? Is it blessings or cursings? Is it goodness or badness? Is it foul language or is it language that encourages and pushes people forward? Because people need blessings in this life. The person that you sat down and the waitress was just absolutely horrible. Absolutely horrible. Do you get mad at her or do you just give her a good tip? Do you get mad at her or are you nice to her? Do you get mad at her or do you try to help her out a little bit? Do you have no idea what that waitress went through before she got there? You have no idea what happened at work that day. And no, you shouldn't have been the recipient of her horribleness. But in the same token, you shouldn't give horribleness back to her as a result of what she's done to you. You see... Whatever you're filled up with is what you will give back. And when you get angry at a waitress that you don't really know just because she didn't bring your meal correctly or she forgot to fill up your glass or she forgot the food or, or whatever she might have done, when you get angry at her, you are saying more about yourself than you are about her. We are to be people of grace and mercy, and peace. That is what we're supposed to rain down on people. And if we're full of those things, that's what we're going to give back. But if we're filled up with, I'm all that and a bag of barbecue potato chips, and nobody should serve me like this, and blah, 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 and it's all about us and our pride, and we're angry at somebody down the road, so we're going to take out some stuff on this waitress that had a bad day with us, uh, it is acid rain. You give to people exactly what is inside of you. What is inside of you today? What is inside of you? Is it hope? Is it love? You know, even when you're in pain, you can still give hope and love. You can still give hope and love. 
what are you giving back to people? And then we come to the most brilliant statement that Solomon has ever made. If a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. Wow. Wow. So that is amazing. Wow. Listen, the next time Nicole asks me what I'm thinking, I'm going to, and it's an argument or something, you know, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? I'm just going to say, well, Nicole, if a tree falls to the ground, that's where it lies. And I'm just going to walk off. <laughs> just going to walk off. If a tree falls, that's where it's going to lie. What in the world, <laughs> Solomon, what in the world are you talking about here? This seems so absolutely ridiculous. Like, everybody knows this. If a tree falls, it's going to stay there. Of course it's going to fall. What are you trying to say? And here is what he is saying. He is saying that each one of us have a forest. And over time, the trees in our forest will fall. And when they fall... That is where they will lie. Sorry, it's hard not to do a Kamala Harris joke right now. (laughs) I'm sorry. I I just had to say that so I could move on. I don't know how you're voting, but it was just hard. I'm just hard. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Sorry. But I don't know why I thought of that just right then. So the tree falls down, and every tree that you have in your forest represents a choice that you've made. It either leans to the north, which is good, a good deed, or it leans to the south, which is a bad deed. What Solomon is saying here, those trees fall. They die, and they fall. And wherever they fall is where they make their mark. Is everybody with me? Wherever they fall, they make their mark. If you're constantly attacking people, if you're constantly not giving people hope, if you are constantly not demonstrating grace and mercy in your life, when the trees fall in your forest, they will make a mark that is not beneficial to the world. But if you are living a life where you give hope to people and you love people and you give grace to people and you seek for peace with people, and you live according to the word of God, and you stand in a very good way for people, when your tree falls to the north, it will make its mark on this world. And Ladies and gentlemen, we need to be a people that make a mark for the glory of God and not for the glory of the devil. Come on. We need to be a people that when we make choices, when they fall and they have impact here on the earth, that it's a positive impact here on the earth. So there might be some of you this morning that just need to have a different attitude when you go to work on Monday. You're sour about work. You don't like what they're doing. You don't like what they're making you do. And so you've complained within your friend group and you constantly are complaining about this, that, and the other. It's time to stop complaining and it's time to start making a difference. Listen, you can't change what's going to happen at work, and you can't change the stupidity that's happening, happening there that is being handed down to you. You can't change that, but what you can change is your reaction to it. And as people of God, you need to make a decision to make a mark that is for the benefit of the kingdom, not for the benefit of your pride. For the benefit of the glory of God and making things better, not for the benefit of just helping the mess continue. Is everybody tracking with me on this? Some of us need to make different decisions when we go to work on Monday. Some of us need to make different decisions when we go home today. We have really ran our mouth way too much. We have really kind of continued to put negative into our family. If that is you, you need to make a decision for your trees to fall a different direction. And you are the only one that can make the tree fall to the north 
or to the south. This is how I know that. This is a picture of a tree at my house. It's in the back. I don't know if you can tell it with all the vines and stuff that's grown on it. But for about two years now, this was a dead tree that um, from time to time would drop its limbs from the top. You know how a tree dies. Sometimes it just drops from the top. Well, over the past two months, this tree, parts of it had, had um, broken off and came toward my house. We have a big tree that actually uh, shielded our house so that the dead tree would hit, hit the live tree and then roll off into my front yard. So I've cleaned up my front yard twice is what has happened with all this. Actually, the second time, some, a neighbor of mine just decided to do it, which I'm very thankful for because, you know... It's a good day when somebody else runs a chainsaw for me. It's a good day. It's a good day. So what happened was I uh, hired somebody to come in and cut down the dead tree because I was concerned because of its weight that eventually the whole thing would fall in my house. And then there's insurance and there's all kinds of mess that you have to go through. And it's just worth $300 to get somebody just to put that thing on the ground to where it won't hit your house. All right. Everybody with me? Well, when he did it, the tree's leaning this way, and he cut it in such a way that it fell this way. So ever how he figured out how to do it, and I don't know how to do that. I just kind of just cut a tree and let it fall. This guy was really good. He cut the tree, and it fell exactly where he wanted it to fall. And it was a benefit to us. So in that analogy, I'm trying to tell you something. Where your trees fall is up to you. Either you are live, leaving a good mark on the world, or you are leaving a sour one on the world. Which one is it? Which one is it? Which one is it? So keep casting your bread upon the water. 